Our next segment is for the House of Delegates 91st District seat. Now, we had two races where one of the candidates could not attend. And in both cases, we invited the other candidate, since it was set up for that, to attend if they wanted to or could. Uh, Senator, uh, Senate candidate Tom Willis uh, was uh, a candidate who was able to make it, but his opponent could not. Uh, Tom Willis elected to not attend. In this particular case, in the 91st, Rick Thompson is the Constitution candidate. There is no Democrat on the slate. And Dr. Joseph DeSoto is the Republican who won a three-way primary. Dr. DeSoto could not attend, but as a courtesy, we extended the invitation to Rick Thompson, the Constitution candidate, since we had the slot reserved, and he was able to attend. So we're giving uh, Rick the, uh, the opportunity here to introduce himself to our audience. And uh, Rick, uh, first off, uh, you'll be, thank you for attending, you'll be questioned by uh, Bill Stubblefield, retired admiral, former Berkeley County Commission president, and John Gilstrap, who is... Uh, one of our co-hosts during the week as well, New York Times bestselling author and a retired safety engineer and former firefighter, too. Uh, Rick, uh, you take your opening statement here. If you could also maybe tell us a little bit about the Constitution Party in West Virginia and, and why you're a member of it. And when you became a member of the Constitution Party in West Virginia, you can incorporate that into your uh, opening statement. That would be appreciated. Go right ahead. Great. Yeah, so I'm uh, Rick Thompson. I'm of the Constitution Party is running for uh, delegate, District uh, 91. That's uh, South Berkeley County. Um, really, the the start of it all was um, probably about a year and a half ago with uh, Marshall Wilson just asking how I could help him and his efforts uh, become governor of uh, West Virginia. And um, he brought up that uh, our district needs a delegate. And um, after further thought, uh, he introduced me to the Constitution Party. And I met with uh, the leaders here in the state. And... Um, Everything on the platform, as far as being constitutionally minded, I feel that um, as a former Republican, that the party doesn't really, the Republican Party really doesn't support constitutional values as a whole. Um, there's much divisions. There's many that are here in, in the state that do try to hold the Constitution as a banner, as a standard. Uh, but I feel that um, it has somewhat kind of left as uh, I mean, some people call them rhinos um, I, I, many of the, the uh, political uh, parties of, of many who have held the offices in the past that are, are in many many year incumbents have changed from uh, Democrat to Republican but still continue to hold the same values as, as the Democrats um, and I, I just feel regardless of whether one party or another the Constitution should be our banner should be our standard so as that, I, I uh, chose to take on the uh, Constitution Party um, and uh, hope to use that as my standard as uh, legislation is brought forth, as legislation is created, and also in, in um, you know, hopefully uh, making sure that we don't have an uh, executive branch, whether it be the federal government, um, you know, in protecting our state's rights or our own uh, governor, and the executive branch in, in exercising um, unlawful orders uh, or directions mandates as well. So um, that's why I'm here and what I hope to do when I get uh, in the legislature. Thank you, Rick. Uh, John, why don't you go with the first question? All right. I, I confess, I, until I started doing research for this interview, I was mm -hmm. fairly unfamiliar with the Constitution Party. So, um, so a lot of the questions I ask are going to be dealing with that, assuming that, that sure. you represent those those ideals. Mm -hmm. uh, am I correct that if elected, you would vote or craft legislation that would reject all federal funds directed toward education if, as, as represented by the Constitutional Party? And if so, how can we possibly afford to do that? So here's, here's uh, and, and honestly, I think Marshall, as, as, as governor, as the executive, uh, has a plan to ba basically go through and audit uh, Department of Education. Um, I think a lot of the money that we use as a state is mismanaged. I believe that many of the money that we're given by the federal government is not honest money. It's um, money that's given to the state in order to enact certain policies that the federal government wants to see. Um, so the hard part is, is once we get that money from the federal government, now we're required to perform the way that the federal government wants us to do. 
Uh, if there was a way for the federal government to provide us with money that we as a state are able to use the way that we see fit, how we see fit, then um, I can see myself approving receiving federal money. The hard part is, again, is that once these federal um, rules for education that are tied to the money uh, are put in, now we're stuck with this organization. Now we're stuck with this group. Now we're stuck with this type of education that we as a state are now have to maintain, but the federal government is no longer giving us money for. And then when they decide to change their mind and say, oh, wait, 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 this is better, then we scrap all of that, the money that we as a state have invested to help support it, because what they have us support doesn't pay for it all and together. We also have to put in our money to help support it as well. So I, don't, I feel overall it's not a, a good use of our limited funds. Do you have an example? Um, gosh, right off the top of my head right now, it seems to leave me, but uh, No Child Left Behind, I think, is, is one that, that has been put up and, and left in many states. Um, I think if they've, a DEI, any type of DEI programs that are put into education or any type of hiring, uh, those those uh, functions are, are a waste of money. And, you know, as we're seeing that it was a great push, and now, you know, they're doing. People are doing what they can to get rid of it, whether it's in the business sector or in the private sector, uh, the public sector as well. Okay. Yeah. Bill, you were not in the primary. One of the benefits of a primary is that you can get introduce yourself to this uh, to the uh, your constituents. Yeah. How are you doing that now? Because you started off behind because you did not have the benefit of a primary. Oh well. Um, <laughs> That's to assume that I wasn't doing any work to get to get my name out there before. In order to, uh, as a third party candidate, I have to go out and get signatures before. So um, I did. I went to fairs. I knocked on doors. Uh, I had friends that would go to businesses. Um, I would meet with groups who had groups together and say, "Hey, we're having a meeting at this time. Please come and introduce yourself." Um, so I, I've been out. I've I've shared my uh, message my hope uh, my desires i've even asked really what what they hope to see from a candidate from a delegate um one of the the biggest things that i got especially in talking to people is that many people who are not voting many people who have decided not to vote anymore because they're tired of this bipartisan binary way of thinking that it's you know and they, they want things to be back to the standard the constitution is a standard and they feel that both parties don't represent either one of them and that the Constitution really could be, in, in my pre uh, presentation to these people, uh, is that the Constitution could be the standard and it actually can unite both parties as the standard. So, uh, uh, so you've been very active in the individual door knocking mm -hmm. for the last couple so months. Yep. That's not... We outside the 91st do not see that. So yes, of it's a, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, have you made? Um, I don't think you've been on WRNR. Have you? Yeah, he did. Yeah. He oh, did had he? Yes. Oh, I must. I, I was. was I was on the phone. I couldn't make it. Yeah. In okay, so, fine. Yeah. Okay, yeah. G uh, can I uh, feed upon the point that John asked a second ago, and that was the uh, uh, the federal dollars that go into our education, health care, and others. If we we get approximately one-fourth, between one-third and one-fourth of our dollars that we generate in the state. The rest of it comes from the federal government. Mm -hmm. If we take in a more ideological approach that we're not going to compromise our beliefs and as a consequence we'll not accept the dollars, can our systems, can our health care system, can our education system survive? Um, I believe they can. Here's here's another way of looking at it. Um, a lot of the things that we as a as a state have to deal with are because of decisions that are made by the federal government. In a sense, if the federal government is going to impose a certain rule or, or policy upon the states or the people, then they should be fined and have to pay for it. You know. So if they want to open the borders and then we have uh, uh, a heavy demand on our education system, our health care system, our police, our fire, that demand by brought in because of a cause of the federal government not doing their job, 
then they in turn should be billed and fined and say, hey, because of your decisions, because of your lack of action, you are responsible for covering these costs. Excuse me, that may apply to other states. It does not really apply to West Virginia. We, we say that, and then it gets here, and we have that issue. Oh, so you're looking ahead as I'm, opposed to what's actually happened, or looking at the possibility. And, I, and, and, and again, I mean, how, how – what what kind of things do we deal with as a state because of federal decisions? Again, what you talked about is the money that's given to us. Sometimes we're limited because of the money that we've accepted from the federal government. It limits us. It limits our ability to take care of our, our citizens here. How would that apply to highway money, Rick? Um, same thing with highway money. Again, the thing is where we're at, especially in, in our particular area in District 91, in the panhandle, we, we have traffic from many states, Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, that are constantly traveling through this short area part of uh, the state. And so we definitely would need, hey, you know what? It's kind of like um, the, um, the metro down in D.C. All these states have to get together to help put that money in to help keep that thing going. Um, same thing for our state. Um, you know, we, we – how many roads do we have that we really don't need but the federal government wants to put it in? Or how many, you know, bullet trains are we going to try to all of a sudden imagine in and say, hey, we're going to go ahead and, and put a bullet train in from, you know, point A to point B or to, to benefit, you know, people from D.C. or uh, So, you know, again, how much of the money is actually spent appropriately and for what cause? What cost does it cost us as a state to – invest in something that a federal government agency wants us to uh, to put into. John. Yeah, I, I as I go through these platforms, some, you know, the Constitution Party, based on the Constitution, right, by mm -hmm. sort of in the name, um, Life, Liberty, Pursuit of Happiness, and in, in your environmental platform, um, oddly, calls for the abolishing of the environmental protection agencies, agency, mm -hmm. and other unconstitutional agencies. Um, this is an area that I actually have some expertise. Uh, how does that work? Um, the EPA will stipulate is a, is a bloated agency, but how do you eliminate it in its entirety? Because under the EPA is clean drinking water and clean air. And yeah, we'll ask it, Flint, Michigan, how they like their clean drinking water. How well, EPA has protected them, ask, and we in West Virginia too have also issues with. Uh, how would it? it not suggesting. It's a successful agency 100% of the right. time. Yeah. But take a look at the Chesapeake Bay. Mm -hmm. Take a look at Newark, New Jersey, the way it was. Look, take a look at Cleveland. Take a mm -hmm. look at a lot of other places where the EPA has worked. By eliminating that, what, what takes its place? I, don't, I, think, I think those states have helped support whatever rules they need to, to make sure that their water is clean. I don't necessarily think that it's because the EPA – has gone in and, and made these states a certain way. I think the states themselves have taken the initiative onto themselves. I mean, you have Vermont of all states, right? Not necessarily where we want to see them. We want to uh, emulate them in, as far as politically wise, but, um, you know, they were a, a state that was cleaned of all trees. The water was dirty, and now they're, you know, they got more trees than, you know, probably the rest of the country. Um, the water is clean, but it's because the state has stepped in and taken responsibility for their infrastructure. And the same thing for us. Well, you, Potomac River, for example, mm -hmm. back before the EPA got involved, before the federal government got involved, mm -hmm. you could not swim in the Potomac River. Now it's a, a fairly pristine river. Mm -hmm. The state's involvement was as a consequence of the pressure from EPA. Yeah, it's, the sure. EPA promulgates sure. the regulations that, make, that force the states yeah. to get involved. Yeah. Sure. Left to their own devices, the states haven't. It's, that's, that's a different debate, sure. I suppose. Yeah. Um, can I do just one more? That sure, yeah, yeah. It's, it's in, the, in the same line here. When it comes to family, you know, the most, mm -hmm. you, it doesn't get more basic in terms of pursuit of happiness. Here, the Constitution Party um, affirms the value of father and mother in the home and opposes the efforts to legalize adoption of children by homosexual singles or couples. Um, uh, comment on that. Is it better to have children in a foster home than it is to have a homosexual couple, loving couple? Well, again, uh, these are ideals, right? The ideally, this is what needs to happen, that the children should be raised by a husband and a wife. 
Um, we have 6,000 foster children in West Virginia. I get it. I get it. It's hard. Um, and not, not all, not all, op, not all things are, are perfect the way that we can have them. And, and yeah, this is an opportunity, but to what extent as well? Um, are these foster homes not good? Um, I was a foster parent for a time of uh, two uh, young boys as well, and and you know did the best that we can, and and saw many failures in in the supporting systems of the school system and other things. And so, um, it, what it took was us as foster parents to take high responsibility and oversight of these kids, and and making sure that they were supported and represented the best way they could. Rick Thompson is running in the 91st. This is the old Don Forst seat. Don lost uh, as a Republican in the primary to uh, Dr. Joseph DeSoto, who is not present uh, for this uh, forum today. Rick, how does it work in practicality should you get elected as a Constitution Party member in Charleston in regards to getting on committees and caucusing in the morning uh, for meetings and such? Do you have any idea how that would play out? Um, I imagine it's not... In the beginning, not so uh, welcoming, but again, as the Constitution Party, they know where my standards are. So those who are creating legislation and would like somebody more constitutionally minded in their committee would definitely want to have me in there. Um, I would try to get on whatever committee that I possibly can, especially as a freshman. That, you know, you start low anyway. Um, not on very many committees or nothing that, you know, shiny and, and great. Um, but the opportunity and knowing that that's where my standards are, that's where I lie, that, that's my guidepost. It's not a personal, um, hey, this is what I think or feel. The Constitution is a Constitution. The Bill of Rights is a Bill of Rights. If, um, and that's what I'm going to go for. And hopefully uh, if we have a governor that is also constitutionally minded first, then um, we won't have to worry too much about, you know, any, any pushes to follow what a majority leader is going to say or want to impose instead of uh, the Constitution. Let me see. Do we have time for a couple of very quick, specific questions for the Eastern Pan Am? We have three minutes. Okay. Uh, home rule, your position is home rule, and your position on certificate of need. So um, certificate of need, again, I mean, any, anything that, um, honestly, location is big. We have a huge need here. Population is, is, a, is a big need. The the pay gap from you know as the uh, as vast as the state is we definitely need something and and companies or hospitals need to be competitive um and however we can do that i think that so long as the state and as the people you know choose and and vote for that then then that's something to be supportive but Again, when it comes to the state can choose, the people here in the state can choose how they want to fund and pay for things. Uh, but as far as having a federal government come in and mandate and tell us how to spend our money and what type of organizations to put in or, or you know, ways to fund the money, um, we need to stay away from that. So Second part was home rule. Um, I'm not sure what home rule is. Okay. You can tell me what home rule is and then I'll do Yeah. Yeah. You've argued about uh, having the federal government too much influence on the state. The same thing can be true that the state has too much influence on the local government. But we're a Dillon state. We can only do what the state gives us permission to do. And so home rule would give the, the county governments more authority. Well, and, and, and as running as delegate, that's, that's my District 91. District 91 is is where my heart will be, and that's where the Constitution will lie. So long as the state again does not impose mandates, we saw this already, where we have government, whether on the federal level, then down trickle down to the, the governor, and and what kind of mandates brought down and affected the people here locally. So that should not happen. That we as local counties, even towns should have a right to say what they need because they know their needs. District 91, we know our needs. Charleston doesn't. Rick, uh, final minute is yours for a closing statement. Um, you know, I, I never really wanted to serve in a political office. Um, it wasn't something that I was really hoping to do. I'm a father of 10 kids, and I work really hard um, to provide for them, for my wife, and I really 
don't like what I've seen in other places. I've lived and grown up in California. I lived in Virginia. And everywhere all these places are going, they're making more and more decisions farther and farther away from, from the Constitution. And I don't want my children to have to leave another state because the legislators, the executive branch, the judicial branch do not follow the Constitution. And the Constitution is there so that we can have our rights secured and protected. Rick, thank you for coming. We appreciate you, your attendance here today. and wish you the best of luck on Election Day. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And that will wrap up our coverage from uh, this uh, forum, the second of our two that we've done. John Gilstrap, thank you very much. My pleasure. Bill Stubblefield as well. Thank you, Rob. To uh, also Nick Verzellini, Mike Hornby, Colin McLaughlin, and Dylan Bishop, uh, as well as all of you who are watching and listening along the various ways you can catch this program on a regular basis. This